there hasn't been any help from anywhere. You can see how people struggle for water every day. What form no go back with thousands in your name? My woman was in Croatia. The Piavi told you about twenty thousand. I saw a lot from Gogacobe. I feel on a kind. But Greg and I am a cow. What do you see? Water is life. We all say it and we know it. In 1957, Ghana won political independence from Britain, the first African country south of the Sahara to do so. During the optimistic days of post-colonialism, she became known as the Black Star of Africa, and Accra, its capital city, came to symbolize the high aspirations most citizens hoped independence would fulfill. Since then, Ghana has enjoyed a checkered but peaceful political history. Accra's water system was built several decades ago and is now under severe pressure from a population in excess of 2 million and another million daily floaters from nearby towns. The main supply source is the Volta River, which lies 100 kilometers away. Consequently, Accra is dependent on the technology that transports safe water over a notable distance to its residents. The Volta is legendary jostle out of the city into open landscape, past the dusty roads and the villages scattered along the Atlantic coastline. Akosombo is our destination, a tranquil model town with great panoramic views and the tourist's favorite must-see. Akosombo also plays host to one of Africa's most successful development projects. This is Akosomo Hydro Electric Generating Station. The dam has created the largest man-made lake in the world, 8,500 square kilometers wide and 400 kilometers long. The spectacular water bowl, carved into the earth like a giant calabash, can supply the whole of West Africa with safe drinking water. The equipment you see over here are entirely manned by Ghanaian engineers and technicians. Here at Akosombo, there is also an efficient and admirable management culture to emulate. The plant generates 912 megawatts of electricity at near capacity. But away from the powerful generators and imposing penstocks, the pylon-lined road leads to another world and another age. Akosombo's scientific wonder fades abruptly into a life that has barely changed over the centuries. The people paddling their canoes proudly as always, earning their living from petty trading, farming and fishing, but barely so these days. Majority of the 90,000 odd people that were displaced by the dam have been resettled, that was over 30 years ago, but the communities are still coming to terms with the amplified challenges of their transformed environment. Safe water can transform the lives of the people here, but that dream is so near, yet so far. We are the banks of the Volta River, and this is their source of drinking water. There's no pipe on water around here. We know this water contains a lot of disease. They, they, they fetch it and they drink it. Even though the water body is here, they should be provided a portable drinking water. In the absence of environmental controls along the Volta's expansive 7,250 kilometer shoreline, it appears to be free season here for the water suppliers. As you can see, 
This is a petrol tanker taking water. When you buy water from a tanker, there is no, there's nobody who has tested whether or not this water is drinkable. Normally they drink it straight. They don't have time to be boiling it. I would say it's only God who is caring for us because it's not treated. It's very bad water. The tanker operators could be a major source of health hazard. If these people get access to good drinking water, we are dealing with health and we are definitely cutting down curative health care costs and obviously improving productivity. Akosombo is one of Africa's most successful development projects completed in the mid-1960s. Remarkably, the Ghana government provided most of the $198 million funding. That resourcefulness has gradually ebbed away. These waters flow freely now into the sea, tossing and turning, rolling and churning and singing along its way. Pong Waterworks sits on the breezy estuary, taking in cupfuls meant to meet the water needs of Accra, 120 million gallons a day. This plant can only manage 45 million gallons daily, and it is struggling to do so. We don't have any water in our reservoir in Tema you know, be, to be stored for a uh, situation where we have power outage and things like that. So the situation is very critical and it also put pressure on the plant. We should have been thinking about expansions far back in 1990. And so we are in now 2004. There's an uh, urgent need to carry out expansion. I have a great respect for my people I work with and they are always up to the task. And I think they need to be commended. The problem we have, the capital to build more structures, the capital to I mean, lay new pipelines to Accra, is what you know, the government is struggling for. Accra is also supplied by the Wager plant, located on its western outskirts. Together with Pong, they produce approximately 85 million gallons daily. This reduces Accra's shortfall to 45 million gallons daily, but the figure keeps rising as Accra expands and its population explodes. The treated water from Pong is piped to Ghana Water Company's reservoir at Tema, then to Accra, where it is pumped into the old water system that mostly supplies the affluent parts of the capital, cantonments, airport residential area, the capital's prime property locations where the diplomatic core, mining and IT companies reside. Accra, Newtown, a poor neighborhood just a stone throw away. Here, many of the residents lay their own pipes. Teshi, one of Accra's oldest neighborhoods, a close-knit community. The people here earn their living mostly from fishing and petty trading. Incomes are low, 50 cents a day on the average, and seasonal unemployment is high. Life in Teshi is also particularly difficult due to the chronic water shortage. The water system broke down years ago, and so every morning, throughout the day, every day, the ritual in the neighborhood is the same, the young and the old scrambling around for water. This is a petrol tank, if, if, if you like, that has been converted to sell water. There's a problem with water here. And it, this has persisted for a very long time, more than 10 years. It's if the government doesn't come to our aid as early as possible, I, I don't know what's going to happen. No no we my name page. No water, no vote. Storage is a problem. 
So even when the water flows uh, in, in a particular day, they can only buy as much as they, they can use in a day or two. There could be more involvement of the people of Teshi in managing their water supply and in giving the current situation that they are in. They, they are a much closer knit people. Um, the, that is the rural, rural Teshi. And then I believe that uh, if they do have some kind of uh, arrangement where there's a community storage, you know, of water that comes in at the time of the ration, then such water could be dispensed over a longer period. <laughs> Medina, another chronic hot spot that has turned scarcity on its head with a new invention. Behold the mini mobile tanker adapted from Chinese agricultural technology and giving an exciting twist to urban entrepreneurship. Medina is frantic, a sprawling township perched on the northern outskirts of Accra bursting at the seams from the constant influx of rural migrants and city exiles. The taps here barely flow twice a week, in most parts of Medina not at all, and so business is brisk as the mobile water vendors ply their trade. Fetching water from where it's available to where it's needed. Most residents of Medina rely on these stopgap merchants, but the health concerns are real. Apart from the fact that we are we are paying exorbitantly for water. We are also being supplied with water that can no longer be described as safe. They use the same containers to fetch water for construction. People drink water that is gathered in ponds. People drink water that when you dip this your brown trousers in, it will come out as indigo or something. And that is the water people are drinking. Just go to Amasaman. And that is the water that people are drinking. It is unacceptable, completely unacceptable. And I think that everybody who is in leadership in one way or the other, government, NGO, religious, whichever kind of leadership anybody is in, we should all be bowing our heads down in shame that at this point in time, we cannot provide water, which is life. <laughs> The quality of the water is so poor that it also affects the health of women and also affects the health of children. In fact, in many communities that there have been new facilities introduced, the things, the kind of things they talk about are one, we now don't walk long distances, two, we now have time saved and even time saved to do what? Time saved to uh, do household chores. In other instances, they are so happy that there's water because now their children can have decent baths and can go to school. Accra hosts many conferences, but this one is unique. Assembled here are government representatives, key experts and leading companies of the global water industry, aiming to find solutions to Africa's most basic but persistent problem, provision of safe and affordable water to its people. According to the UN, no single intervention has more overall impact on development and public health than the provision of safe drinking water and proper sanitation. Those without access are the poorest and least powerful. Access is therefore an essential component to any effort to alleviate poverty. The problems associated with water scarcity are well understood here. Beyond diagnosis, however, preferred solutions vary. What technologies are most appropriate for Africa, and how do we eradicate waterborne diseases such as the Guinea worm? Most crucially, how does Africa mobilize the investment capital that can rebuild and expand its archaic and decrepit water systems? A sizable proportion of our people in Africa do not have reasonable access to adequate and reliable water and sanitation facilities. Government alone would not be able to bear the enormous investment required to revamp the sector and has decided to partner 
with the private sector to introduce greater operational and managerial efficiency into the sector. It's clear that the model that's been working before has failed and we need to look towards a different way of supplying and producing water, not just in Lagos State but in Africa as a whole. For the urban sector alone, about 1.6 billion US dollars is needed at an annual inflow of about 100 million dollars if the planned national target of 100% coverage by the year 2015 is to be attained. The World Bank has played a key role in Ghana's water sector and is currently the major investor. The bank has also contributed to a spirited debate about how to resolve what many now see as Ghana's water crisis. The bank's latest financial package to rescue the water sector comes after considerable delay, partly due to strong local opposition to the privatization of water. We're making a breakthrough and making a very major investment in urban water, small towns water and community water. This is a major, major uh, re-engagement in the water sector that we're seeing. The whole project is a, for urban water is $120 million, of which the bank puts in $103 million. And the rest is uh, the Ghanaian government and the Nordic Development Fund. And um, a, a bit, as I said, will go for the management contract, but over 95% will go to actually uh, improving uh, the situation. There have been difficulties with efficient functioning of many public sector or many public institutions. Um, those difficulties can be assessed properly and overcome. And we don't think that the answer to public sector failure is simply to privatize. I hope to take this project to the board in the bank in, in July and the government is, is ready to go. All they need to do is lend the money to the Ghana government and we look at ways to reform the accountability system in, in particular and the efficiency and effectiveness of Ghana Water Company Limited. The government uh, has been uh, opting for a, a, a management option which we call an incentives-based or performance-based which means that if the new management performs they will get paid, if they don't they won't. And uh, the idea is to complement whatever that might cost, uh, some five million dollars with uh, over a hundred million dollars to actually get the job done. It's not surprising that the World Bank finally chooses for a management contract. Management contract is the last in the menu of privatization options that the World Bank usually prefers. At the top of the list usually is concessions, from concessions to lease arrangements. From lease arrangements, when all of those things fail, management contract is the last one. And uh, so when the lease arrangement failed because the, the companies that were expected to bring capital into investing in, in the privatization arrangement pulled out because they couldn't afford the expectations of capital, management contract was the last one the World Bank simply picks out of its menu. There's a lot of pressure on the kind of infrastructure that exists. And you need to address that in a fundamental way. Instead of simply thinking that the problems of water delivery are the problems of the fact that they belong to the public sector. If you see it that way, then it means you are presenting a solution which is not addressing the kind of problem that actually exists. You know, so we don't think that the answer to the water problem is simply privatization. A major one is a question of planning. The Ghana Water Company will still be uh, the company uh, that uh, is responsible for providing water in urban areas. The only th change, you know, that will happen is that at the leadership of Ghana Water Company, there will be some experts from experienced firms who know how to run this better than in the past. That's basically the difference. We're targeting precisely what has been the weakness in the past, the management. Yes, there is a management problem. But no, the, it is not the case that there are no competent managers in Ghana Water Company Limited. What we, what we had to do after almost 10 years of discussion was at a point again, and that happened about a year ago, sit down, look at all the options, 
not engaging the private sector at all, engaging them full out in some lease arrangement that was talked about before, or going for something which is, uh, well, not quite in between, but this uh, performance-based management contract solution. And after weighing pros and cons and discussing uh, in depth with very many stakeholders, the government chose. And we said we would have engaged in any way, but on this basis, we felt very comfortable that we wanted to go in uh, at full length with the $100 million. Why is it that the World Bank and its allies, for example, insist on this monoculture, that the only model which has to be followed is what puts these resources on the market for corporations to control? This is the issue. If donors are paying 90 to 95 percent of the capital requirements for improving our water supply, no wonder that they come with the principles that informed their own judgments that water is an economic commodity and if you need it, you've got to pay for it. And since you're going to borrow money from us anyway, this is one of the conditions that assures us that you can repay back our loan. So the discussion shifts, not so much from prov providing water as a right and an entitlement to the citizens of Ghana. It shifts to loan management. What can we do in your water sector to ensure that the money that you're borrowing is paid back? Ghana is a member of the World Bank, is a member of the Bretton Woods Institution. It has full rights to borrow, but it also has full rights to borrow according to the needs of its people. So that the question then is not borrowing externally, the question is the conditions which are attached to, to that borrowing. And if the conditions means that investment decisions are market driven and therefore are not based on the social and economic and even the political considerations, you know, emanating from our society's needs, then I think that that is, that is the wrong way to go. There's too much dependence, I believe, in Africa on multilateral and donor money. And we all forget one fact, maybe because I have a financial background. Remember, when we borrow these monies or we get these grants, they are given to us in dollars. Whereas, we have to generate revenue in our local currencies to pay it back. Clearly, there's a shortfall because, at least from what I've seen, I've not seen any African currency increase in value, except maybe the rand. Before the contract is signed, we would have scrutinized it and even maybe contributed to portions that um, relate to our objectives and to our, our, our mandates. So we will make sure that these are enshrined in the contract. The more we borrow, the more indebted we become. And the more indebted we become, the more resources we mobilize domestically from taxes that go into paying this debt. The truth of the matter is a lot of these, quote, private sector participation initiatives in Africa have all failed. And they've all failed because, in my opinion, they have tried to replicate what works in Europe in Africa. And it doesn't work that way. The price will rise uh, so that um, the utility companies can maintain their levels, levels of service. But um, we also believe that the, uh, protecting the poor doesn't necessarily have to be through the tariffs. There can be or there should be other ways of um, targeting the poor. They stand to gain. For them, it's an efficient process. The cost for the rest of us is too high. Uh, look, I, I welcome the debate that we've had for over 10 years. And uh, the government has looked at several options. There have been lots of discussions. Not everyone is in agreement, but at some point in time, you have to make a decision and move forward. And so we head out of Accra again, this time to the northern capital of Tamale, to join ex-US President Jimmy Carter, whose foundation has been helping to eradicate Guinea worm. This parasitic disease is contracted through drinking contaminated water. After some successes, Ghana has slipped back to become the second most endemic country in the world, nowhere more so than in its northern part. Mr. Carter takes his message to the president, Mr. Ajay Kum Kufour. Ghana has had an increase uh, the last few years, last three years, uh, the number of cases has, uh, has increased by about 3,500 cases. But we think the emphasis on the filter cloths, plus continuing with the borehole wells, will be this successful. 
once it's eradicated from a, a village's a pond, it, it never comes back unless someone with guinea worm wades in the pond, as you know. So it's a very, it's a very damaging thing uh, economically because farmers can't go to the field and children can't go to school. But we were very emotionally uh, touched today by the little children who have guinea worm coming out of their bodies, we saw uh, a whole group of them. We estimate that uh, we'll need to provide about 100, averagely 100 wells every year for the next three to five years uh, to really make the dent we want because we estimate uh, there are about uh, so something like 500 communities that must be supplied with, as I said, averagely 100 wells. A woman who herself has got guinea worm, who cannot work, who cannot do anything, also has to take care of the household, who themselves, perhaps one or two, have also got guinea worm and cannot do anything. We care for you. We want you not to have guinea worm in the future. We wish you well. Thank you very much. The northern landscape is the driest in Ghana. It is closer in character to the semi-arid conditions of the savannah belts than the evergreen forest region to the south. Cities like Tamale and Navrongo have sizable populations, but small towns and villages are more spaced out with less developed economic infrastructure. The rainfall pattern is very erratic. Almost seven to nine months of the year, water is actually a critical issue. It's very, very difficult for you to get the water table. There have been instances where several NGOs have dug in the Tolonkumbungi area and also in the Guchu area just to get water. And that has actually proved very difficult. Beyond the metropolis, it becomes difficult to service them with pipes. Maybe the dam option will be better with filtration tanks. Maybe we may have to think of how they access resources that can help them transport water within a radius of, say, two kilometers. There are many challenges here, but a small community is bravely leading the way to provide its own safe water supply. Savulugu is a town in the northern region, which as a result of its notorious statistic of being the, the small town with the highest guinea worm infection per capita in the country, woke up to that reality, recognized the importance of water, and then in collaboration with the district assembly, set up a community-based water board that actually went to every single house, zoned the town into areas, demarcated them in such a way as to ensure that they could provide water at vantage locations. The water is now moving. they decided that the first step is to make sure that they have water in the town. Now, when you see any Savilogo, it looks so fresh and healthy. But of late, you know, when you come, like you come, you see people walking with sticks. It is amazing what happens when communities take the driver's seat in being the central focus of their own water plant. Savilogo water is cheaper than Tamale because we want to be affordable for everybody to get access to it. Another significance of Savulugu is that they do not have an independent water source. So they, ne they negotiated with the Ghana Water Company to supply water to them in bulk. And at the gate of the town, they have a, a meter, a bulk meter. The town then takes over through its water board and redistributes this water to these vantage points where, where community residents are in charge of collecting tariffs. We have to make sure the money is intact and there should be a transparency. Every month we call the we account to our community, every month. As we speak today, Savulugu is probably the most reliable single client of the Ghana Water Company because they only have to deliver one bill. So here we have a win-win situation. Ghana Water Company, under that circumstance, cannot be inefficient because if they don't deliver water to this bulk town, they don't get paid. The town itself is the most efficient in managing. Can you believe that they have been able to reduce distribution losses to less than 5%? Because every morning, volunteer residents 
walk the length and breadth of the pipeline to ensure that no water is leaking, let alone have anybody waste water in their homes. For four years, there's no breakdown. We haven't shut everything down. Some donors helped. UNICEF was very, very instrumental in it. But the help that donors provided in that context was qualitatively different from the kind of help donors provide to central government. In this case, donors simply provided their funds to the assembly and the funds were managed by the assembly and the community-based water board. So the contracting of the people to do the work was done locally. And therefore, they could effectively monitor the contract, ensure that services that were supposed to be rendered to them are rendered on time. By contrast, we have many, many contracts awarded across this country that are incomplete. Why? Because they were awarded in Accra either by Ghana Water Company or Community Water and Sanitation Agency. Community residents are not part of the contracting arrangement. So if the contract is not finished, tough luck. <laughs> Guinea worm has reduced drastically, but it has not been eradicated. It has reduced drastically, one, because they have produced some water, are managing it efficiently, therefore the majority of residents now have access to water, but it's not sufficient. They are able to serve water maybe two or three hours a day. And there is still a large dam very close to the town, which still serves as an alternative source of water, especially for people who live within the vicinity. And the tricky thing about Guinea worm is that if you have one case or two, it is very, very resilient. They sat down, planned according to the topology of the area, according to the needs of the specific environment, and they are winning now. In what way can we replicate this? This is one of the social investments that the people of Savalugu have made into their own development. And this is what we need to encourage in many more places. We leave Tamale with optimistic thoughts about Savalugu and take the picturesque route back to the south. The Volta again bears its soul. But downstream, it's time for another reality check. When you look very closely, you could see particles of engine oil, dust, washed from the vehicles into the river, polluting it before people come to fetch it to bring. Where is the water when there is so much thirst in the land and the heaven fails to open up? Where is the water when the sun scorches the city dry and there is so much thirst? We need to definitely change the situation that confronts us now regarding uh, water supply for most of our communities in the country. The issue has been how do we raise funds sufficient enough to help us to accomplish this noble task? Now, there are only two ways we can raise funds for this purpose. One could be from donor, um, do donor support, and the other one could come from us internally within this country. Raising money internally may lessen dependence on foreign sources of capital, but how feasible is it? Does it matter that Ghana is a low-income country with an average GDP of $400 per person, or about $1 a day? I think we, we have... Um a real issue with long-term financing um, um, in Ghana. Um, I think the savings rate is somewhere in the early teens. Um, uh, and really, to get the type of investable capital that we need, we need to be saving around a 30-35% uh, of GDP rate, and we are nowhere near there. If we price properly, then it means that um, there's going to be enough money to improve and increase and expand the systems. So th it's important that the tariff is right. Otherwise, the utilities will not be able to um, be viable and also have enough money to expand the systems and, and extend it to areas that are required. Is the internal capital market buoyant enough? 
I think raising uh, 150 million dollars also for the water sector um, it's not going to be an easy um, transaction um, so far at least in the past year or so uh, we have had a number of IPOs and these have been in the 1 million dollar to the 10 million dollar range um, uh, we also have principally um, financial industry that the banking sector um, buying um, bonds for example and they have to keep buying treasury bills. Ghanaians are investing in their water sector. They may not necessarily be surrendering the money to the state but they are. People are building underground tanks. Some are drilling boreholes, hander wells in their own homes. People both rich and poor are suffering to gain access to water. What we need to do to be able to overcome the uh, contingent con uh, conditionalities that confront us day after day is to be able to show that we have built the necessary internal capacity to be able to attract an external capacity uh, reinforcement. Without that, we go nowhere and the problem will forever be here. We in the financial industry will not only a, have to find the average Ghanaian investor to participate, we will also have a hard marketing job to do as to the capacity um, of management um, to protect investors' funds. I think public investment is the way to go. With a different economy which puts need before profit and liberalization, it will be more than possible to finance uh, 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 an adequate viable water sector which will give its own offshoots in terms of economic gain and uh, human welfare for, for, for the people of our country. In Ghana, our dependence on donor support has often blighted our, 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 our vision. It is possible um, to look at maybe tranches you know, of five to ten million um, that, that may be done and also um, illustrate the capacity of management um, to put that through. Uh, but we don't even have a history of municipal bond financing um, uh, and would have imagined that if uh, metropolis like Accra, Tama and Kumasi have done that, you would have given investors some sense um, of how um, municipal bonds um, are done and floated and how performance occurs. And I think the water may fall into that category in people's minds. If you consider finance or investment as a sum of money, which is required to do renewals of the infrastructure, to expand the network, that would be a mistake. It's misleading because it does not capture the whole implications of finance. Investment is also a relationship. All the people that you have captured in your film, those who are struggling for water, all of those people, their rates, their consumptions, their tariffs, their taxes, is what has financed the, the water sector so far. But the reason why the water sector has not served them is that control of that investment and the decision making around investment decisions has not, not been in, the, in those people's hands and therefore their interests have, have been marginalized. In other places, government even raises money directly from the private sector to sponsor public projects and they pay back with time. We are looking at unbundling it to even smaller units. This, I think, will also create the avenue where entirely local entrepreneurs can participate because if you make it too large, they, their own capacity to raise finance for that is limited. So um, we are looking at ensuring that we evolve a model that also allows um, local entrepreneurs to participate in it. What prevents us as a nation from making additional taxation on alcohol, which in fact consumes a large quantity of the portable water that ought to be available for the majority of our citizenry? Well, of course, it's available for some who consume alcohol in, in liters, but I don't think alcohol consumers would mind at all. You know, a, a little surcharge on uh, alcoholic beverages. Meanwhile, on every street, sachet water, the latest product of the new breed of water entrepreneurs, has invaded the country. Water quenches thirst, and in the city, where it boils over in the tropical heat, there is a lot of thirst. Yes, pure water. It's called pure water, and you know, 
how how it becomes pure water you know because it is sealed but what goes into into that sachet is anybody's guess you I think that's one of the cheapest way of getting water to the people and having access to water is by putting it in the sachet, you know. There's also the question of psychological diverting the consumption of tap water, you know, into so-called pure sachet water. That is that's making water more expensive for the average consumer. One problem always related to the drinking water, to the sachet um, water use, is the plastic problem. And we see it all over, all our gutters are stuck with plastic. What choices do people have? You're traveling, you're thirsty, there are no rest stops anywhere, you know, very few. And those rest stops, you cannot be sure about the quality of the water there anyway. So you buy this sachet water and after you finish, you throw it by the roadside. So that is creating its own pollution. One solution is recycling. And we have in Accra already one recycling plant. Um, the problem here is that they can only recycle very, very clean plastic. So we need many more dustbins in town to collect the plastic, the drinking water sachets, whatever, before they get actually dirty. Recycling of plastic waste is certainly something which is very important. But even more important is to create the awareness that not the people who use them just throw them somewhere. They have to be collected only then recycling works. It's very bad. It makes the surrounding very poor, dirty. I don't think it's only the pure water people who have to share their responsibility. Anybody who manufactures pl plastic must um, help. I think somebody should uh, have a recycling plant where they pay money for people to collect those bags and for everyone even if it's 50 peso people will start cleaning up the roads of Ghana. We don't have a recycling um, program in this country so we, we're not dealing with that we're not taking out the bottles we're not taking out the cans we're not taking out the plastics and it's offensive and it is a major health hazard the flies are moving from there onto the food, onto people's hands, into, onto children's faces, you know, and just causing a lot of havoc. It's a public health menace. Because we cook, that, we cook our foods for very long, that it destroys all the gems, but it is not true, you know. Even if the cooking destroys quite a few of the gems, the handling, you know, the water sources, whether, and, and there is uh, a lot of research showing that a lot of water bodies are contaminated. We have advertisements about washing your hands with soap and water and things, you know. The soap may be there. Where is the water? Sometimes the water you're using to wash your hands is dirty. So by actually washing your hands, you are endangering your health. In a city like Accra, social commentary is rife and radio has become an important barometer measuring how society is coping with the water crisis and poor sanitation. Seventy percent of diseases in Ghana can be attributed to inadequate water and sanitation. Poor drainage also provides breeding grounds for mosquitoes, a factor in the high level of malaria infections. Another day breaks in the small village of Sege and the children are filling up the cans by the local pool. Amongst them is Titi, a 12-year-old schoolboy. When it gets to the Hamatan season, you don't get water here. Water gets case. We walk about two kilometers before we get water on a bridge. That place to cattle to having drinking some of the water, which is also unhealthy. We have to wake up in the night around four. We go and fetch water before we can sometimes we get late to school. 
Our teachers sometimes used to cane us. Titi knows this route well. He passes here several times a day until the big drum at home is full. He hopes to become an engineer in future, but with no piped water at home, he spends more time, it would appear, fetching water than being at school. His family is supportive, but everyone here has a role to play. This is my father, these are my sisters, and this is my brother. We don't have pipe bomb water. We buy our water from tankers, which one bucket costs 600 CDs. And then we, in fact, we are feeling it. We, we, we cannot afford that for a long time. We are always in difficult uh, situation. And so because the water is not good, we have to put this a lot into it before the water will be somehow fine for us. Ghana's water crisis transcends all classes of society. It is the one social resource that is so basic that most people think about it only when it's not there. There are areas of our national life that we can say belongs to us, you know, and that we cannot be dependent on anybody else. We want to solve other development problems such as health. We need to solve the water problem. People are going to war over water sources. If we are lucky and we have them in abundance, I think that we should manage them properly. We should harness them to um, improve the quality of life. Water's spiritual significance is also deeply ingrained in the Ghanaian psyche, which sees it more as a gift of life for generations to come. Indeed, the first thing a Ghanaian family, rich or poor, offers when you visit is water. To be able to sustain the life, to be able to help in national development, water is of grave importance. Ghana has paid her dues. Citizens have paid their dues to get us to where we are at now, and we should take it to the next level to make this country governable and enjoyable. Water is so fundamental. If we do not resolve that problem, then the whole question of development, the whole question of sustainable development, environmental development, human welfare development, economic development, political development, all those things will be retarded and undermined fatally. There is the general convergence about the need for lasting solutions to the water crisis. But real issues about financing a sustainable water sector remain. Will it come from abroad or can it be raised locally? The one thing everyone agrees on is that water is life and the issues it raises will remain pertinent for the foreseeable future. A delicacy I know here is uh, fufu and granite uh, soup. Nobody can prepare it better than Ghanaians. So it makes sense that if you want it prepared well, you get as many Ghanaians as possible to participate in the cooking. <laughs>